The first speaker is Professor Mire Buskemilu. Um, and the talk is already up, so take it away, Mire. Okay, thank you. So can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. And can you second question is can you see my mouse moving? Uh, yes. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. So I, I first met Richard, I think, in 1994 in Bordeaux, when he and Alex and maybe Tony were visiting us. And to be perfectly frank, I don't remember this first visit, but my notebook from that time, as you can see, does remember it. So these are some not so good notes that apparently I took on the 30th of June, 1994 of one of Richard's talk. And so at the time, I think I was mostly fighting with English and also I was exposed essentially for the first time to the Statphys vocabulary. So in the same notes, I'm painfully translating partition function into generating function and so on. And so this is certainly one of the many things that my uh, acquaintance with the Melbourne group uh, brought me. So what I do remember, however, is the next year when I visited uh, Melbourne during the spring of 1995. And there, well, Richard was part of this uh, very friendly group of people. Uh, who were making life very enjoyable for the visitor that I was with the Chris Soteros as well. Hi, Chris. And so, yes, yeah, so Richard, uh, well, as you all know, was a amusing and a friendly person and with whom it was fun uh, chatting, having dinner, jogging, and so on. I also remember Tony mentioned wildlife. I also remember that he and uh, Rachel took probably Chris and me um, to watch koalas in the wild. And this is certainly the only time in my life that I've seen koalas in the wild. Okay, and then I, I met Richard regularly during uh, many workshops and conferences, and it was uh, always very good moments to spend some time with him. So uh, I'm glad to see you, or some of you, but uh, it's certainly a sad occasion. Um, I wanted to say also a few words about uh, Richard's mathematics. Um, his interests, I think, were rather diverse. And I think he had some, some good mathematical taste, if there is something like that. Or maybe it's just, I'm just saying that he had a taste that were close to mine. In particular, I was always very intrigued by his, his work on oscillating walks and the crazy formula that he has and that I have probably never completely understood. So today I'm not going to talk about these oscillating walks, but still about lattice walks in which he had a lot of interest as well. And more precisely about walks that are confined in a cone as on these pictures. So in this, uh, in this problem, well, the basic question can be asked very easily. So you are saying Z2, could be ZD, but let's say Z2, and you choose a set S of steps, a finite set of steps. For instance, here, these four. And you also choose a starting point, P0, which in our case will always be the origin of the lattice here. And in addition to that, you take a code like for instance this uh, green quadrant here and you consider lattice walks that first start from your point p0 take their steps in your allowed collection of steps s and have to remain all the time in this cone and you want to know what is the number a of n of n step walks of this type and very often one is led to refine this question by also prescribing the coordinates ij of the endpoint. So there are many good reasons to, to count um, lattice walks in a cone. Essentially, they encode many, many kinds of objects. And I realized that I started to work on such questions at least 20 years ago. 
And in fact, so this is, these are the, the proceedings of the FPSAC conference in Melbourne exactly 20 years ago. And it's really possible that Richard did this uh, poster here, I'm not sure. And I was already talking about walks in the quarter plane as I will do today. And so in those 20 years, this uh, topic became quite popular and uh, attracted uh, a large number of people with diverse interests again. And in particular, it has also become a Melbourne topic. So back to my numbers. So as usual, you put this sequence or this three-dimensional array of numbers in generating functions which depend on one main variable, t. So that's the length variable. And then I add two more variables, x and y, if I also want to record the coordinates ij of the final point. So two remarks here. Um, the first one, of course, if I set x and y to one in this big three variable series, then every walk just contributes t to the length, and I recover this series a. And the second remark I will use a lot. Um, if you assume that your cone is in the right half plane, then uh, you can replace x by zero because all these uh, abscesses i, they are always non-negative, so this is well-defined. And what survives here in your generating function is just uh, the walks that end at abscissa zero that is on the y-axis. So this means that this specialization a of zero y t counts walks ending on the y-axis. This will be convenient. So can we question, can we express this series? And more than that, we would like to be able to know their nature. And what I mean by that is that we would like to decide whether they fit and where they fit in a certain classical hierarchy of formal power series, which I've illustrated here. So you have four main classes of increasing generality in this hierarchy. So I've defined them here for one variable series, but there are counterparts for series with more variables. So our simplest series, they are the rational ones, ratios of polynomials, and then comes a bigger class, algebraic series, which are those that satisfy a polynomial equation like here. Then comes an even bigger class, definite series, those that satisfy now a differential equation, which must be linear with polynomial coefficients. And then the fourth class consists of D algebraic series, satisfying still a differential equation, but this time it is polynomial and not necessarily linear. And of course, uh, there are series that just do not fit in my chest of drawers. Uh, they are in the big black cloud. So returning to cones and walks in a cone, well, there are essentially two well-known results. The first one is very, very, very simple. It tells you that if your cone is the full space, so you have no constraint on your walks. Then say if you have four allowed steps, uh, the number of walks with n steps is uh, four to the n. And these are the coefficients of a rational series. So they all go in the first row. Now the next case that's also well understood is the case of walks in a half space. And there it has been known since essentially the 80s that the generating function of such walks is always algebraic. And so then the next case is the case of a true cone, which can be convex like this one, in which case you can always uh, deform it into uh, say the first quadrant like that. Of course, it changes your collection of steps, but that's fine. And here that's not illustrated here, but I will have a few picture pictures at the end, you can also have a non-convex cone, which you would deform um, in a three quadrant cone. So what about the nature of the series? Well, for a while it was mildly believed, I would say, 
that maybe all this series would be definite and fit here in this drawer. But as you will see, this is not the case, and this is not the case at all. You have you find series for quadrant walks in each of these uh, five drawers or cloud, and the same holds for three quadrants. So I would say that most of the of the work that has been done uh, focuses on first quadrant, the cone is the first quadrant, and then one also only considers um, small steps. That is, you choose your set S of allowed steps in this subset of eight steps. So there's just two to the eight um, step sets, I also say models, that you can consider. And moreover, a number of them are trivial for various reasons. Imagine, for instance, that your set S just consists of a north step, well, then all walks stay in the quadrant and that's done. And some other models will be equivalent just to a half plane problem, which is algebraic. And then you can play with the XY symmetry. And so at the end, it's not hard to see that there are really 79 interesting and really distinct models that you have to consider. This is one of them. So here they are. So at the bottom, you can see the five singular models. They are those uh, where all steps are on or above the second diagonal. And they are always a bit special. You have always to do something special for them. And here are the 74 hours. Others, sorry. So one wants to address all these counting problems in a uniform way, in a systematic way. And to do that, essentially, you can only start with one thing, namely the very simple recurrence relation satisfied by the numbers qijn of walks of length n ending at ij. And you may notice that I changed my notation. It's no longer a, but q, like quadrant or quarter plane, or whatever. And the same happened to my generating function, which is also q of x, y, t. And very often I will drop the t in my notation. So if you construct walks step by step, you will write a recurrence relation for these numbers or equivalently a functional equation for the series. And we're going to, to look at an example just to fix things. So I take these uh, three steps and these pictures and equation, they tell you the same. They tell you that the walk in the quadrant is either reduced to just a point, the starting point, or otherwise it's obtained by taking a shorter walk of length n minus one, say the black one, and appending one of the three allowed steps. So certainly this increases the length by one, and it also slightly modifies the coordinates of the endpoint. And here you see what I denote x bar is always one over x and same for y. So this is really the generating function of the three allowed steps in the correct order. I call it sometimes the step polynomial. Okay, but the problem is that I cannot stop here because I've built too many walks. And in particular, I've built two types of walks that exit the quadrant, and I want to subtract their contributions. So here you have a walk that was ending on the y-axis, but we know that they are counted by this specialization of Q, to which I've added a west step, T x bar. And here you have something that's completely symmetric. So that's our equation. And we can, of course, group together the two terms in Q of X, Y. So you see on the right-hand side, you have these two specializations. And on the left, you have the main series, of course, times a certain polynomial that we call the kernel. So this is one minus T times the step polynomial. Okay, so this equation is typical of what you get for any model if you want to count walks in a quadrant. 
And the question is, how can we solve such equations in systematically or as systematically as possible? So now, 20 years later, I can tell you that this is completely understood. And these 79 models of walks with small steps in the quadrant, you know where they fit. So this is a summary somehow of the result. So for each model, you can define a certain group G, which I won't define, which is finite in 23 cases. And these are precisely the models for which Q is definite. And then among these 23 models, you have exactly four that are even algebraic. The others are transcendental, that is non-algebraic. And in fact, they, these 19 models, they are easier to solve than the four algebraic ones, even though this series could be seen as simpler. And on the non-definite side, you have something very similar with nine models that are still de-algebraic, the remaining ones being not de-algebraic. And what's very nice is that this classification has been achieved using a wide variety of tools, ranging from the kind of thing I play with, that is basic um, algebra and formal power series, to much more sophisticated tools like this uh, Galois theory of difference equation, which is really what you need to prove that certain series are not de-algebraic. So I would like to do still a, a bit of mathematics in these talks. So I'm going to present um, certain algebraic techniques for solving these four algebraic cases using the notion of invariance which was introduced by Tut in the 70s and turns out to be very useful here. So I need a definition. This will be the only one in my talk. So what are invariants? So you fix your collection of steps and the corresponding step polynomial S of X, Y. And you take a pair of series, I of X, J of Y. So they are series in T even though I've not included T in the notation, they are series in T with coefficients that are rational functions in X for the first one or in Y for the second. And this is a pair of invariants if when I take the difference I minus J divide by the kernel one minus T S, I get a series H, a series H, which is a series in T, which should have poles of bounded order at zero. So let me tell you what I mean with that. So you have this series H, so you expand it in T, the nth coefficient is a rational function in X and Y, the denominator splits into a product uh, like this due to the, the form of H. And what you want is that maybe after multiplying by a monomial in X and Y, you don't see powers of X or Y in these denominators. That is, for instance, you don't want to have something like T to the N over X to the N. There would be poles of unbounded order at zero. So that's a condition. And I will say sometimes for short that I minus J is divisible by the kernel when the quotient satisfies this condition. So do invariance exist? Well, yes, you always have trivial invariance. If you take for I and J the same series in T, not involving X nor Y, then the difference is zero, H is zero, and you have a trivial pair of invariants. But fortunately, that's not all. So for instance, let me take again these uh, three steps, so-called Creveras model. Then I claim, and it's very easy to check, of course, that if you define I zero to be this little Lorentz polynomial, which you can view as a series in T, and J zero is the same function, but that one. And you take the difference. 
and you see that the kernel arises as a factor. And what you have here is a series H, which has poles of order one at zero. So that's fine. So this I zero, J zero, they form a pair of rational invariants. It's not all models that will admit rational invariants. We'll see later which ones do. Okay, but that's not, that's not all. I claim that there is another easy pair of invariants for this model, which this time involves the series Q. I call them Q invariants. So where do they come from? So here is again your functional equation. And you see the right-hand side is almost of the form i of x minus j of y, but not quite because of this product here. But it turns out that you can write this product as a sum of a function of x, a function of y and t, modulo the kernel. And then using these two lines, well, you can write that a certain function of x involving q plus or minus a certain function of y is a multiple of the kernel. So this is your function h, which has no poles at zero. Okay, so let's summarize. So for this model, we have found two pairs of invariants, a rational one, i0, j0, zero, zero, and another one involving q. What can we do with them? Well, I will show you that in fact, you can find a relation between them using two basic lemmas. The first one tells you that essentially the set of invariants forms a ring. That is, if you have two pairs of invariants, you can always take the sum or the product component wise, and you still get a pair of invariants. That's very easy to prove. So for instance, I can take i0 squared, j0 squared, and this will be another pair of invariants. And then there's a second lemma, which tells you that if you happen to find the pair of invariants that have no poles at zero, well, these ones, they do have poles at zero, well, they have to be trivial. That is independent of x and y. Okay, so now what's tempting is to try to cook up invariants with no poles at zero from the ones that we have. So here in I1, we have a simple pole at zero and in I0, a double pole. Okay, so let's form I1 squared. So we will have one of our X squared, that's X bar squared. And then there's a product, a simple pole coming from here, which will be minus x bar over t, which happens to be the simple pole here as well. So what I'm saying here is that if you take i1 squared minus i0, it has no pole. And given the form of j1 and j0, the same holds for j1 squared minus j0. So we define this new pair i, j. Thanks to the first lemma, it is a pair of invariants. And thanks to the second one, this series only depend on t, but not on x or y. So now we have something. Let me write it down again. So this i1 was depending on q. So we have proved that this series in Q of X, y, of X zero only depends on T. So in particular, it's equal to its value when X is zero. And we obtain this equation involving now Q of zero, zero. So if I summarize, we started from an equation involving Q of X, Y and its two specializations. And using these two pairs of invariants, we've derived an equation involving just Q of X zero and its specialization. It may be interesting 
And in this case, it is because one knows that such equations where you have just one variable that's being replaced by something uh, first can be solved in a systematic way and then that the solutions are always algebraic. So in fact, this is the end of the, of the problem for this model. And so here I've shown you the uh, generating function Q of X zero in terms of a certain cubic series here. Okay, so you may think, well, this is just one example that works nicely. So what about the 79 other models? Well, I've shown you the classification. And in fact, what happens is that these 23 models that had the finite group and were definite are precisely those that admit a pair I0, J0 of rational invariance. And among them, there are four that admit Q invariance, and they are exactly the algebraic ones. And similarly, here on the non-definite side, you have exactly nine models that admit invariance in terms of the series Q, and they are the D-algebraic ones. So really, this tells you that this notion of invariance is really, I think, central in this classification of quadrant models. And to finish, I want to tell you a bit more about what's happening at the moment for the next problem, which is walks in three quadrants. Um, the second picture here is just to show that if your set of steps is uh, singular, then all walks, whatever you do, they stay in the three quadrant in three quadrants. So their generating function is rational and you don't have to study them. But for the 74 remaining ones, you can play the same game, write a functional equation for the series and so on, and ask about the nature of the corresponding series. So I think the only fairly general result that's known is this one, that is the ones with an infinite group that is with no rational invariance are not definite. And this has been proved using an asymptotic argument. And then I think that exactly 10 models have been completely solved. Uh, there are 10 models that are symmetric in the first diagonal, but not all of them. There are still some that are not solved. And so far, what happens is exactly uh, what you've seen for the quadrant problem. And in particular, so you have six of these models have rational invariance, so they are the same as for the quadrant problems. But then the three among them that have Q invariance, they also have invariance in terms of the three quadrant series. And you can prove that they are algebraic. And similarly, this one, you can prove that it is the algebraic using uh, invariance. Okay, and I will finish with one important uh, reference which is a paper in preparation by Andrew L.V. Price, who uh, has proved, uh, I think, at least he gave a talk about that, um, that in fact, the classification is really the same for the quadrant problem and for the three quadrant problem, at least as far as the X and Y variables are concerned. So for instance, I think he, the kind of thing he can prove is that for this model, say you have um, differential equations in X and Y, but the question of T remains open. Okay, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Mary. Hey, so a couple of minutes for a question or two. Um, maybe I'll start with online people. Is there anyone who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question? No? Okay. Right. Well, I, yeah. I have one question, but it, may I? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I have one question, but it might just open a whole long answer. Um, if you put any sort of boundary weights onto those walks, so if you weight contacts with a boundary, there has been some work by some people on some of these models 
uh, and I think it's oh yes Andrew likes the question <laughs> and I think it's there's actually nothing really understood uh, so far is that correct except it's a lot worse I think that's a fair uh, fair thing to say uh, yes so you're very right and in particular there's some Melbourne in the wide sense contributions on walks in the quadrant interacting with their boundaries um, what happens is that the functional equation that you can write is a bit more complex. And this creates lots of difficulties. I wouldn't say that there is no hope, but definitely it requires um, a, a lot of work. Okay, any other online questions? Might open it up to the audience here. Anybody have a question here? No? Okay. Um, well, I've, I've got maybe a quick one, although we're sort of running out of time. Is there any sensible way of trying to classify the non D algebraic problems rather than just leave it as one big clump of complicated things? Is there any sort of finer resolution that would be natural there? I would say that the uh, uh, the five singular ones they should be they should be separate. So here you have five singular models, the ones that are above the diagonal, and uh, th there's many things that are different for these ones. And in particular, you can always write uh, the solution in a fairly explicit way as a sum, an infinite sum of algebraic series, for instance, which is not the case for the others. Um, in fact, what happens is that um, for the you have this kernel and it co there corresponds a curve in the in C two, and the genus of this curve uh, is zero for these uh, five models and one for all the others. So this is the only distinction that I see between the various non-D algebraic cases. But I'm not I'm not the expert. Really, I tend to prove positive results. That is, there is a differential equation, there is an algebraic equation, and so on. That's all that I see. Okay, thanks very much, Mary. Uh, we'll probably push for time. So let's thank Mary one more time. Okay.